let's kick things off. Uh, Frank, could you please tell us a little bit about yourself, where you come from, and, and your research? Yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm a chemist. Uh, AJ, you already said that, by the other way. Uh, I'm a chemist in the biology institute. And uh, yeah, so a little bit about the story, how I got here. Um, uh, I, I enjoyed uh, playing with chemicals in high school and decided to study chemistry. So I started doing that, dabbled a little bit also in theoretical physics at the time. And then uh, really I got fascinated by identifying new compounds, new molecules from nature during my PhD in Germany. And at the time these were uh, metabolites from insects that mediated communication between um, males and females or sort of uh, aggregation pheromones or chemical signals that told the insects how to interact with each other or how to talk to each other. And I pursued that work uh, then further here at Cornell in Jerry Meinwald's lab. And uh, then I got interested in John Clardy's work at Harvard Medical School because he was looking at uh, small molecules metabolized in the broader context. And uh, at Harvard then I learned about the model system C. elegans, a tiny little worm that we'll talk about later, I think. Yes. Um, so, so that worm really proved to be a, 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 a great accretion, a great discovery for me because it turned out to be an extremely chemist-friendly model system that allowed us to, to dig much deeper into the role that small molecules, naturally occurring small molecules, play for, for the lives of animals. Yeah, and it sounds, um, it seems counterintuitive to me that this teeny tiny microscopic worm has some relevance to, to humans, but it does, right? It's, they have very similar. They, they are, you know, it, it's always uh, relatively similar, right? So uh, if, we, if we try to do uh, biochemistry, then you need a model system that we can work with. And if you want to work with mice, which are more similar to humans, obviously, than the little worms, then uh, yeah, you have you have a problem, right? You're doing experiments with mice; it's slow. If you want to do a lifespan experiment in mice, it takes several years. Now the worm uh, is evolutionarily clearly more distinct from humans than than mice, but it's also very similar in many regards. So its uh, basic physiology and biochemistry is quite similar. So they have a nervous system, they have a digestive tract, they have muscle, uh, and the signaling processes that, that govern its life history, they're also very similar, right? So they use serotonin, uh, so they can be the equivalent of sad, right? You can have happy worms. Uh, you can have worms that are diabetic in a sense, right? So these little worms actually have been a really important model for understanding diabetes and insulin signaling better. Uh, in, in general, aging is really a fantastic model for, for aging. So we, we will get into that a, in a little bit. Um, but I, I would also like to start off, um, talk a little bit about metabolites, because um, that is so important to your work. And I, I know we have a, a slide here. Um, yeah, yeah, okay, that slide. Uh, very good. So, you know, we, we hear when we talk about uh, biology today, um, of course, much of it is driven by our ability to manipulate the genome, right? So, we have about 20,000 genes in humans, 20,000 genes in C. elegans. And uh, of course, mm -hmm. it's true that uh, uh, manipulating the genome allows you to control many life history. Uh, history traits, but uh, what is left on people's radar is that living organisms produce many, many thousands of additional compounds that also have important biological functions, sometimes downstream of, of genes. They have a gene that encodes a protein that then produces certain small molecules, but also there is uh, the opposite direction of regulation, if you will, so small molecules determine whether a gene is expressed, whether a protein can function. So small molecules play just as important of a role in biology as, let's say, proteins. And now, they are much harder to study, though, today, 
with the tools that we have in, in, in biology, everything is directed at uh, looking at uh, genes, the making knockouts of genes, uh, whereas techniques to manipulate small molecules, they're just being developed. And that's really our field, right? We're, we're into discovering these metabolisms, defining their chemical structure. What most people are not aware of is that, that most of the chemicals, for example, in the human body, they're still unknown. They have not been characterized. And so that's one of our major objectives to develop techniques that allow us to identify the chemical structures of these compounds and then to place them into a biological context to show how they mediate development, how they are responsible for disease phenotypes, or can help us to develop new treatment approaches for diseases such as diabetes or cancer. Right, and, and one of these, um, I don't know, model isn't the right word, but one um, source of metabolites you look, at, you look at is the microbiome, right? Bacteria that live in our digestive tract and elsewhere. Yeah, so, so what makes metabolites so complicated? You, can, you may wonder why do we know so little, comparatively little about metabolites relative to what we know about the human genome, right? The human genome was fully sequenced about 20 years ago or so, and still we don't know what the human metabolite is. So why is that? There's two reasons. One is that the chemical diversity of the metabolome is tremendous and highly unpredictable. So I can't predict what the chemical structures will be that I, I will find in a specific organism. And then uh, the second aspect is that that's uh, what you were alluding to, uh, is that small molecules often are exchanged between different organisms. So all the small molecules that we have in the human body, they are produced by the uh, human, by the, by the human organism itself, but also may originate from the microbiota. We have uh, an enormously large number of uh, bacterial cells in our gut, but also on, on our skin and other parts of our body. And, and these bacteria, they contribute a very large portion of the chemistry that, that we carry around. And you came out with a really cool paper in, uh, in Nature in 2019, um, looking at some of the micro microbiome in mice. Did yeah, so there we compared we compared the metabolome of germ-free mice and uh, normal mice, right? So with mice, uh, you can actually get them germ-free or almost germ-free, so they have no uh, bacteria in their gut or at least you hope they don't have any. They have no bacteria on the skin. And uh, these mice are not very healthy. They have many, many uh, defects. And interestingly, they have uh, behavioral anomalies. So for example, they have great difficulty for getting uh, bad memories, if you will. Mm. So if they've been exposed to something threatening, they can't get over it, right? They can't forget it. Whereas normal mice, just like humans, eventually get over it, right? You had a bad experience, but eventually the, that memory will fade away. Now these germ-free mice, they, 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 they have difficulty getting over these uh, events that they experience. And uh, we showed that that is associated with specific changes in the composition of, of the brain, of the metabolites that you find in the brain of these mice. And those changes we could then tie to the absence of the microbiome in their guts. Right, so here we have a direct connection between a missing microbiome, missing bacteria, and uh, severe, uh, severe behavioral anomalies. So just having the right bacteria in your gut could help you like alleviate anxiety or, or PTSD potentially? I think there's, there's not many papers that, that uh, have uh, lent support to that connection, right? So if, if there's a problem with the microbiome, then uh, very likely you, you may 
uh, behave differently, you may uh, have different levels of uh, um, enthusiasm, the drive, energy. Uh, you may also be more prone to depression or less prone to depression, depending on what your, what your microbiome is, right? So what the difficulty really arises from, from identifying exactly which bacteria are good and which bacteria are bad. And that and can be not different for different people, people, right? Exactly, right? And it may not, it may be different for different people, right? So for some, for some individuals, uh, a certain microbiome may be perfect and they may be perfectly happy with it, but the same microbiome in a different person uh, may, may have different, different effects. Mm -hmm. So it's really the interaction between host and microbiota that, that, that uh, we need to understand that. Okay. And obviously, neither of us are medical doctors, so I should probably put that disclaimer out there. No, oh, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. This is the most advanced right? It's basic science that we're doing here, and and others may may be able to extrapolate that and uh, and see how it uh, is relevant for for really. Uh, yeah, I have definitely seen a lot more of that in recent years. Of you know, I kind of wonder how much how much to trust of. No, drink this yogurt drink, and you know it'll cure all your problems or whatever. Like I, I, I know I know there's a lot of good science behind a lot of this stuff, but it's hard for me to to really grasp and, and understand and evaluate like what what is worth listening to and what is real and what is just kind of snake oil. Yeah, I think skepticism is, is, is an important trait, not only for scientists but also for for anyone reading science from. From our more general audience, right? So uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a big step to go from basic science to, uh, you know, let's say, a nutritional recommendation. Right, right. And um, OK, let's move on. You had another really cool paper, another Nature paper, in, uh, just last year in 2020, where you were using the, the C. elegans, the groundworms. Yeah, so, you know, uh, as I said in, in earlier in our conversation, uh, using mice is very difficult, right? You could say for, for ethical reasons, but then, then also in terms of resources, doing experiments with mice is very, very, very challenging. So in, in, uh, well, if you can, then you try to move to a simpler model system, right? The tiny worms, the elegance that we talked about earlier. And uh, so, that that's what we did and uh, in in this particular study that you mentioned we looked more closely at the interaction of this worm and certain bacteria that is naturally interacting with us and uh, these bacteria actually make a neurotransmitter called tyramine and we showed that the production of the neurotransmitter by the microbiota is really essential for the for the health of the of the one right so we directly uh, we were able to make a direct connection between neurotransmitter production in the bacteria and uh, the the health and uh, behavioral characteristics of the one. and just just to make sure i'm clear so a neurotransmitter is that that's a signal that one neuron releases to another neuron and then that tells your brain something or and so neurotransmitter do many different things. Right? They, they coordinate how one cell behaves, but they also are very important for uh, how two neurons interact with each other. So one neuron may secrete a neuron, neurotransmitter, and that's then perceived by the next neuron that is connected to, for example, CS and F. And that then triggers a signal that moves along. Right. So mm -hmm. while we're having this conversation, neurotransmitters are constantly exchanged between cells of our nervous system. And that, that facilitates them, um, all, all the processes that, that underlie our action. In this, this particular one, tyramine, it, um, it influenced how they ate, right? It was like how they yeah. smelled. So it, was, they... it was particularly the, the aspect of their behavior that we that we looked at was really the feeding behavior. That's something one can measure fairly easily. But uh, I think it's, it's clear from, from uh, the overall results of the study that many aspects of the elegant behavior are really influenced by um, this one bacterial compound, right? So in this particular study, we looked at production of uh, 
uh, one type of bacterial metabolite and how that influences the world. Now, in a more natural context, the worm would feed on many different bacteria that would provide many different molecules. Right. All of those together then will influence the behavior. And so it's a very complex system that makes it so hard to study, even in the worm. And thus, you can imagine it would be almost impossible, perhaps, to do in, in, in humans, right? Maybe in mice, you mentioned. That was the complicated was the exact word I was going to use, or complex. It sounds it's, that's um, quite a quite a problem, a logic, logical problem. Um, okay, and and um, so you also talked about metabolites can impact physical de development. I believe uh, we touched on that a little bit earlier. Um, could you tell us a little bit about that? I know you did a study um, also using C. elegans earlier. Oh, this is a good slide. Yeah, so C. elegans is really uh, one of the uh, premier models to, to study animal development. And uh, the C. elegans research community is large, but a lot of those people really work on development. Right, so development, how we go from a single cell to a fully differentiated animal that has a nervous system, muscle, gut, that can be studied extremely well. So a lot is known about what happens while the worm develops here in this slide, you see an egg, right? You just have one cell in the beginning, then two cells, and then it, 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 you know, it, it slowly turns into a little worm, <laughs> or one larva, and then it's turn between L2 larva and so on mm. eventually out okay. of the And uh, what uh, the early C. elegans researchers noticed was that these worms, they can abort development. They can just stop uh, at mid-development. Let's say if you want to have a human comparison, they can stop at age eight or nine, nine years old, and mm -hmm. uh, stop developing and stop eating and turn into worms uh, that can then persist for many months. So they enter some sort of diapause. It's called the dauer diapause from the German word for enduring dauer. And uh, these worms are fascinating because they're so robust, you can put bleach on them as that they survive. Wow. And uh, so, so this, this uh, dauer state was shown to be a response to uh, environmental stresses. So if you stress these little worms, they go into that. But also it was clear that the worms themselves make a compound that tells their fellows to also go into the diapause. So if one worm, worm experiences stress, mm -hmm. it will produce compounds that tells everybody else also to stop developing. Let's go into this diapause state. Let's get really robust and wait until the threat to stress has gone. Mm. And uh, we were then involved in identifying the chemical nature of the signal that was produced by the worm and tells everybody else to go into the diapause state. And uh, this chemical signal turned out to be composed of a family of compounds called garazides. And those compounds then turned out to regulate not only the diapause, but also to regulate aging. Mm. I think we have another, and can we see the next slide? Mike, could you help us? Uh, yeah, so this is a more chemical slide, right? So actually two chemical structures in the upper right. So those are two ascarosides. And uh, what this slide shows is uh, the effect of these compounds on the lifespan of worms. So what this is, is a lifespan graph where everybody is alive at the beginning, and everybody is dead here at the end at 24 days. And 24 days, you can imagine, corresponds to a 100-year-old human, right? So the worms, they, they don't really get much older than three and a half weeks or so. Now, the red curve here, those are worms that just eat their normal diet. And you can see, well, after 23 days, everybody is dead. However, if you just give them a tiny bit of this compound here called Asker 3 on the top, they live substantially longer, right? You can say, oh, 
actually quite a few of the worms to make it to the uh, 100 year age, if you want. Now, if you change the chemical structure of this compound just a little bit, as shown here in the other compound after 10, then you get the opposite effect. You actually get lifespan shortening, right? So that's why I picked this example, because you can show that the really, really tiny change in the chemical structure. You can see right yeah. just runs off these two things. It's really, really small. Even if you don't know any chemistry, you can see that the different yeah. level structure is minor. There's, there's a one double bond. That's the only right. difference. Exactly. One double bond between life and death, right? And the difference is either you have an average lifespan of let's say 80 years in human terms, or you everybody dies at the age of 55, right? So that's uh, it, it, it's a very dramatic effect of just one or two compounds. And of course, there's many, many more that the worms make and that they are exposed to also from the bacteria that they interact with. So what we think is that uh, these effects are not, uh, you know, not unique to worms. And all animals constantly interact with each other and with microbiota and all the chemicals that we are exposed to, they they influence lifespan, they influence our susceptibility to disease, they influence our behavior and uh, every every other aspect of, of our life right. history that you can think of. Right. Including uh, uh, sexual maturity showed in one paper too, right? Yes, including sexual maturity, right? So actually what we found is that compounds that extend lifespan, they usually associated with uh, an effect uh, on puberty and usually things that make you live longer delay the onset of sexual maturity. And conversely, things that uh, trigger pathways that lead to a shorter lifespan, uh, those result in earlier puberty, right? So we have here this, this, uh, this kind of uh, balance here between compounds like this molecule here on the left that uh, it's, it's responsible for fast development, reaching uh, puberty, if you will, very early, also shortening lifespan. And then these other compounds that we already talked about, these ascaricides that slow down development in addition to giving a long lifespan. Mm -hmm. And uh, so just to touch back again on how this could be related to, to humans. I mean, is there, here we go. So here's another. Did you talk about this slide a little bit? Yeah. So of course it's it's uh it, no it's a big step we're taking here. Right? We were talking about uh, maturity, sexual maturity in worms, and now we have a picture here that shows uh, the average age at which uh, uh, girls uh, reach puberty, and uh, there may not be a direct connection, but uh, it's certainly remarkable that. Uh, the the uh, age of reaching puberty has dramatically declined over the past 150 years or so, right? And there's uh, different statistics in different countries, and there may be all kinds of biases here that go into this graph. So uh, all of this should should be taken with uh, some caution. But really, the the uh -huh. underlying reason for this decline in the the age or the earlier, earlier maturation of uh, uh, young, young women and also young men. And um, that's not really clear. I suspect that better nutrition plays a role, many, many other things. But I think uh, the role of environmental small molecules should not be underestimated, right? Mm -hmm. It's very, very, very well possible and perhaps a good hypothesis uh, to, uh, to assume that uh, part of this decline is due to exposure of small molecules, environmental small molecules. And, and pheromones as well, right? Isn't that- uh... it, could be, it could be also pheromones. Of course, that would get very speculative, right? So I think just to say it could be in part environmental yeah. uh, small molecules, I think that's a good hypothesis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I, I I remember seeing from that other paper that the the chemicals that made the the C. elegans worms reach sexual maturity more quickly is is 
closely related to things that are in to chemical compounds that are in human sweat. Is that correct? Kind of. That's true. That's true. But uh, of course, um, the chemistry, the basic biochemistry, the defining ones, is very similar to that of humans. So any compound you may identify from worms, or most of them, may have similar compounds uh, or uh, analogs in humans. Mm. And just because there is a structural or chemical similarity, we cannot automatically assume that the compound has the same function. Right, so that's that's not the true, not the case. Right. Right. This example that we had earlier, I think, may show that. But right? we just add a double bond to get the opposite. Right. right. So really, uh, even similar chemicals may have very very double bonds. Yeah. That makes chemistry so complicated, right? So right. say, okay, this molecule is good for you, but then a very small change may turn it into something that's not good for you or has the opposite effect. Right. And it's also interesting, I was thinking, you know, as as human, uh, you know, age of puberty is decreasing, our lifetimes are increasing. So it's, there, it's even more complicated, right? Like our diet is better, medicine is, is medicine better. Is better. Those are external influences, right? So but what we have to look at is other measures of aging and health span, right? And we have, uh, I think if we go back a couple hundred or even a couple thousand years, there were always people who lived to 90 or 100 years old, right? So mm -hmm. I don't think a maximal human lifespan has increased significantly um, over the, the past couple hundred years. Right? Average lifespan, for sure, absolutely. But maximal lifespan, I don't think it's so clear. Just more people are, are reaching it or getting more close to it. People are reaching old age, but if you look at the, you know, the, the oldest right. people alive today, they're not older than the oldest people alive 50 years ago. Right, right. So, what are what are some of the other implications? Do you think of your researches on on aging, in particular? I think what we really need to do is uh, characterize the human metabolome. Maybe start with the mouse metabolome, and look at uh, the time points at which different metabolites are made. Right. So, if you, if you look at the, an organism uh, only at one time point you may miss important, very important things. So what we're currently trying to do, again, in the model system of the elegance, is really to pinpoint when are different molecules made, because that may help us understand how they promote their biological effects. And for many compounds, we don't even know what they do. It may tell us um, what context they may have, right? what uh, roles they may play. And by looking at, uh, the metabolome of very young animals, older animals, and very, very old animals, we may be able to understand what processes really underlie this, this decline and how we can perhaps uh, use these molecules to understand the mechanism to, that, that mediate or control the whole process. And at that stage, we can move to, to higher animals, right? Once we understand the mechanisms, we can see whether perhaps in mice, similar mechanisms are at work and uh, then try to manipulate lifespan in mice. Are there a lot of people working on this? this well, uh, I, there are a lot of people working on aging in C. elegans. So that's really a big deal because it's just such a great model. We have a lifespan of three weeks, right? You can, can come to uh, you get some results within a few months as opposed to a couple of years. And, Small molecules uh, are uh, still uh, an area where, where we need more people, right? So obviously, small molecules are important for every aspect of, of animal development, animal life history. And uh, yeah, so we need more chemists uh, to join the board, but also more biologists to get interested in chemistry. Because, right. I mean, there's so many different aspects. Uh, you know, the air we breathe, just stuff, whatever's in the water, you know, um, our diets, all kinds of things, what's in the rain. And, and you know, the, the thing that people, many, uh, many biologists, I think I'm not aware of is how little we know, right? And how yeah. many, uh, how many compounds we're constantly exposed to, and uh, how much the uh, presence of these metabolites affects the outcome of biological stuff. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, let's um, let's move to the Q and A. We have a few questions in here um, from Sunanda Das. Um, it looks like the main question is: Could could you kindly discuss the chemical dark matter of the metabolism? Yeah, that's what I was just trying to kind of yeah. trying to uh, interest people in. Yeah, so um, you know, if you take a, a human blood sample and you you ask me, okay, so how many chemicals? different chemicals can you detect? I, I'd say, oh, a couple of 10,000, maybe close to 100,000. And then the next question could be, okay, what are those chemicals? And I have to say, well, I can probably identify maybe 5,000 and for 10,000, I can tell you roughly what they are. Yeah. But for the majority, probably I, I can't tell you what they are. Right? Maybe I can have a very rough gap, guess as to what compound class they may belong to, but essentially that's not the problem. Yeah. That's why what we refer to as the chemical dark matter. That makes sense. And to you, is this the chemistry of life? That's a pretty interesting question. Philosophical question. Yeah, it's a philosophical uh, question. The chemistry of life is how all the molecules interact. Right? It's not only the small molecules, the small molecules mm -hmm. interact with the large molecules, Small molecules serving as building blocks for the large molecules and as a whole system, right? So that's yeah. everything. Here's another question Is there a role for big data in helping to establish the cause and effect correlations and connections with other research, not necessarily using C. elegans, to understand the roles of metabolites? And are there any computational scientists involved in this type of research? It's a good question. It's a beautiful question. So, uh, biologists have been fantastic in, 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 in harnessing bioinformatic tools, com getting computational uh, scientists involved in uh, looking at genomes, at genomic data, proteomic data. And uh, on the metabolomic side, we're still basically in the stone age, if you will, right? So we're far, far behind. So we really need to bring the bring the uh, big data uh, tools, the experience that, that people have with uh, genomic and proteomic data, we need to bring that to bear on, on chemistry to take advantage of that. That's one of the big challenges right now to make sure that within the chemistry community, we develop an infrastructure that, that allow us, us to share uh, all the data for especially metabolomic analysis, right? So people analyze metabolomes, and then most of the data today does, net, does not get curated, does not get sent to a central repository, but instead gets thrown away. Right. So, and of course, that, that's not a sustainable situation that really prevents progress. And uh, so I think uh, what is happening now um, is that, that people realize that this is one major step we need to take. Mm -hmm. It sounds like it would be very very difficult. I, I would suspect more difficult in genes and proteins since, like you showed, you know, those two compounds, one double bond different is something completely different as opposed to like a lot of genes. If you have, you know, 99% of the, of the nucleotides are identical, then they're probably going to, you know, do something similar. I they may, but they may also do something different, right? So I think uh, whether, whether it's genomics, proteomics, or metabolomics, each area has its own challenges. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think we just need to tailor databases, mm -hmm. search algorithms, and uh, data sharing strategies for metabolomics. Right? We have to adjust. We can't just take what, what people have used for sharing for the only data. We have to adjust that. Mm -hmm. um, what are the sources of small molecules you purified? I think there was a number of different sources, right? From Bacteria. Yeah, so uh, we we uh, we have analyzed uh, compounds from from worms, right? From bacteria, from from mice, uh, from human blood samples. So we've looked at a, a wide variety of metabolome samples over the past couple of years. Okay, so it's come from laboratory cultures or from from collections, right? So. Uh, there's several kinds of regulations that we have to follow, of course, in order to collect these samples. And uh, yeah, so what, part, part of the work in my lab aims to um, 
show that metabolites that we find from one source, let's say from C. elegans, they're also present in other organisms or also play biological roles in, in other organisms. Mm -hmm. And how much of the small molecules needed to cause the mouse's microbiome changes? I'm not sure. Um, so I think uh, I'm not, not exactly sure what is meant here, but uh, in general, very, very small quantities of small molecules can have very, very profound effects. Right? So I mean, sometimes it's, it's a few nanograms of a molecule that can completely change um, a, a disease trajectory or behavior of, of a mouse. And it can be femtograms for a worm, right? Of course, the worm is also very small. So small molecules can be biologically active over a very, very wide range of concentrations. That's actually an important point to touch on um, because it, it's, it's hard to, to fathom or grasp really um, what that means. So some compounds like glucose, right, they produce millimolar, really con high concentration of visible amounts in order to have an effect, right? It tastes sweet, for example. But other compounds may be so active that a completely invisible quantity has a very, very profound effect. Yeah, because for the, for the mouse study, you were using germ-free mice, you said, right? And then you were basically implanting them with, with a microbiome. Is that how you were doing that study? Uh, I think in the in the mouse study, what we started with was uh, just comparing comparing the germ free mice with the normal mice. I see. Right. So, and what we're currently doing is we're putting back different bacteria into the germ free mice. Actually, that's work by David Ardis at Wild Cornell. He's doing all the mouse studies, and uh, what their team is now doing is they're looking at uh, mono colonized mice, where you just have a, a mouse that was germ free and then got one specific type of bacteria or a group of bacteria put back in to see what does this specific bacteria have in terms of effect on, on behavior. And how do you administer the small molecules to mice? I mean, you are- uh... So there's, there's different, different ways to do that, right? So what you need to make sure is that the small molecule gets to where you think it may act. And uh, so sometimes you can just give the small molecule in the water and you know, just add it to the water and get an effect. Sometimes you need to inject the small molecule. Okay. And you were also looking at, in that study, you were looking at the metabolites that were in the like cerebral spinal fluid, correct? That's where you were. Exactly, or in the brain, right? So you can't, I mean, you can't administer compounds in other ways, but that wasn't necessary here, right? So in this study, compounds were administered, uh, I think, primarily through the drinking water. Mm. And uh, in some cases, I believe injected. Okay. Next question. Uh, these are great questions. Uh, how far are we from a technology like NIR slash infrared or other non-invasive slash non-destructive imaging tools that would detect metabolites in real time in worms, plants, or humans? A fantastic question. So we're very, very far away from that, right? So my dream is to have some type of analytical technology that would allow me to really see the individual compounds, right? In a cell, if you look at a, a, a human or C. elegans cell, it's, it's not a balloon, a homogenous balloon. It's compartmentalized. There's mm -hmm. different rooms, right? Different portions that have very, very different chemicals. And for the biological effects of a small molecule, it's very important where it is, right? In which cellular compartment it, it finds itself. So uh, we're still very far away from that. We're now developing some tools that give us some initial insight to where compounds are and uh, how, they, how they move through the cell but we're really at the very beginning. Mm. And probably which cell there, there is. Fact, the initial question would be which tissue, right? Next, right. which cell, then where in the cell? Is it in the membrane? Is it in the nucleus? Is it in the mitochondria and the peroxisome? There's uh, yeah, many, many different places in the cell where a compound can be. And what we already know is that different parts of the cell have completely different metabolism. 
And then you compound that with, you know, with, with your diet and that's might not be directly influencing you, but it's influencing your microbiome. And then that's, what's influencing you. So there's all, right. so, I mean, the microbiome has really effect on several different levels, right? Mm -hmm. So the microbiome, they produce compounds that are absorbed, right? And then mm -hmm. may have effects in the body, depending on where they get transported to. So that's the mm -hmm. transport component, but then the microbiome also metabolizes compounds that uh, the human secretes into the intestine. So it's not just the microbiome makes compounds and we're taking up those compounds. Yeah. It's also that the microbiome is act actively uh, involved in modifying things that we already make. For example, right. bile acids, they're secreted in the gut and then the bacteria modify those bile acids further, then they are reabsorbed by the human body and transported to, to all kinds of places, controlling immunity, controlling many, many aspects. Of right. health. I didn't know that. That's really interesting. <clears throat> okay, next question. Your work is expanding into agriculture. Can you comment about how, work, how worm metabolites may affect plants? Yeah, so that's, that's a nice question also. So, um, Many of the compounds that we've identified from worms, they are not only made by the laboratory model species, the elegans, they're also made by many other ones, by worms that exist uh, in the soil outside uh, my window here that also are parasites of plants and animals. Right? So what we're not so much aware of today is that uh, almost uh, every animal in the wild is carrying worms and every plant that you have is somehow in an association with worms in the soil. And it appears that uh, plants have learned to talk to worms or somehow interact chemically with the worms in the soil. And uh, what we have observed, for example, is that plants respond by upregulating their defense responses when detecting certain compounds. For example, the compounds that I showed earlier today in, in one of the slides, they are perceived by plants, by tomato plants, by cabbage plants, by many other plants we tested, probably by most plants. All of these plants have learned to detect worms in the soil by way of these chemicals. And uh, what they then do is they, they know to protect themselves from, from invasion by upregulating defense but the interaction may actually be more complicated. There may also be a beneficial effect for the worm in that interaction. But uh, this is a nice example that shows how small molecule functions, they transcend one organism, right? So it's a network of interactions where small molecules play a central role. Yeah, and, and it's really cool. You had that paper where um, you and Dan, I think, had the paper um, where the plants will actually sense one of the worm molecules, metabolize it, and excrete this new one back out that tells that the That's yet another dimension, right? Yet yeah. another dimension. Yeah. So one, one point is, okay, so the plant detects the molecule, upregulates its defense responses. Mm -hmm. The next uh, more recent finding is that the plant takes the worm molecule, changes it a bit, and then puts it back out of the soil. And then the worms actually respond to the altered molecules. They, they move away, right? So yeah. you could uh, think of this as a population control mechanism mm -hmm. where uh, basically the worms realize, oh, that plant already is infected with worms. We better stay away. Or you could look at it from the perspective of the plant and say, oh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to secrete this compound that will keep other worms away so I don't get infected anymore. Right? So it depends on the perspective uh, that you take if you, if you want to characterize this, this uh, signal in, in, in human terms. Yeah, I, I just like that idea of like plants learning the worm's language and then like throwing out propaganda. You, you can look at it this way, right? You can look at it this way. You can say, oh, the plant learns the worm's language. And that's actually true to some extent. But you could also say the worm harnesses the uh, right. Right. metabolic capacity of the plant to learn 
whether a plant is already infected or not. Mm -hmm. so, so it's only an interaction, right? So it's, it's, yeah. a, it's a complex back and forth, a give and take, if you will. Right. Yeah, it's pretty fascinating, you know, especially because it, it excretes those compounds, right? It's not just kind of leaking yeah, so out. The plant, the plant takes up uh, the compound that the worm makes, then changes it, and mm -hmm. then uh, secretes it into the soil. Yeah. Yeah, so. Yeah, that's a good one. Uh, one more question um, from Rob Canizares. Uh, given the enormous diversity, how do scientists sy systematize metabolites to build a coherent operating system? I think uh, it's still an open question, and we're uh, we're open to suggestions. I have to say so, and um, we're we're categorizing compounds uh, by way of chemical relatedness, right? So we we uh, put compounds together that are chemically related, but there's many other systems or attempts to, to uh, develop systems for categorizing metabolites. You can also categorize the molecules um, with regard to their biosynthetic origin. I put all molecules that come from one specific biosynthetic pathway together. Uh, you can also try to, uh, to uh, organize metabolites according to biological function. And all of these different ways of category, categorizing metabolites they are they are different and they they result in different categories right you have compounds that look very different but have exactly the same biological effect you may have compounds that look very similar but have very different biological effects you may have compounds that look very similar they come from the same biosynthetic pathway but sometimes you also have molecules that look very very similar but they have just co-evolved to look similar they actually come from very very different So just organizing the couple organizing the data and the chemical structures, that is still a challenge. Right. It'd also be interesting to look at the evolution of those different compounds and see, you know, where the different pathways kind of converged across different species. Absolutely. And uh, you find many examples of co-evolution where you have the same, exact same molecule uh, getting made by very, very different species through pathways that seem very, very different. But still you have the same chemical structure and maybe even the similar biological context. And uh, you have also, I think, opposite examples. Mm -hmm. okay, we, have a, we have another question. Um, as worms can evade animal immune systems and live undetected, are there any potential clinical slash healthcare applications for attenuating autoimmune diseases in animals with worm metabolites? There, there are, there, there are. And uh, we have a paper that is in review that, that discusses exactly this, uh, this idea, right? So one big question um, in parasitology in general is how do parasites manage to survive for so long? in the host organism, right? You would think the host organism would kick out the parasites or uh, in, in the attempt of, of trying to get rid of them, perhaps kill itself, right? Because it's, it's uh, uh, a really a major uh, perturbation or disturbance if you suddenly have a worm crawling, crawling through your tissue. And uh, what is clear is that the parasites have ways to evade the immune system of the host. And small molecules appear to play a major role in that. And so we, we, we think we have identified some of the small molecules that play a role. Okay, that was the last question. I think that's good timing. Um, if anyone else, we can do one, one more. If anybody wants to type real fast, get something in there. All right, I don't think so. I think that's good. All right, uh, so Dr. Frank Schroeder, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. That was that was really, that was a lot of fun. I enjoyed that one. And thank you to everyone out there who joined us um, for this uh, fun Breaking Ground discussion. And please join us for BTI's next Breaking Ground discussion series, which is a special edition of Breaking Ground. Uh, it's the art at BTI. 
And uh, for those of you familiar with Art at BTI, um, we're excited to do this event virtually again this year. And for those of you who are not familiar with Art at BTI, please, uh, please definitely come check it out because it's a lot of fun. Um, and it's very, very unique. Uh, we pair an artist who is inspired by plants with a BTI researcher who can help provide some scientific context. And this year's event will be Thursday, June 24th. And we'll be talking with special guest, Zachary Logan, a Canadian artist inspired in part by the, by the botanical preservations and drawings of Mary Delaney. And Zachary creates large scale drawings and ceramic works exploring themes of self-discovery, identity, memory, and place. And just to give um, some idea of the scale, this beautiful illustration you see on the slide here is about four feet by 10 feet. It's giant, gigantic tapestry. So he does these really gigantic, gorgeous, gorgeous pieces of artwork. And uh, he will be joined by BTI's Fei Wei Li, who will discuss his experiences working with herbaria, which are collections of preserved plant specimens, as well as their history and how these repositories can be used to document climate change track pathogens, and even identify new species. Art and science come together as we engage around historic herbaria and how they've inspired contemporary art and research. So it's gonna be a really good one. So please don't miss it. Uh, and you can go to btiscience.org for more information and to register. And let me get um, that URL into the chat for you all. Uh, let's see, I got a few other ones. I'll put them all in there all at once, all panelists and attendees. There we go. Um, <clears throat> and you can read more about BTI's current research and many other neat stories about BTI science in our annual report, which you can find online at btiscience.org slash annual report. And it is all digital with three different views, single page view, a two page view, which is most similar to seeing a hard copy and a reading view, uh, which is easier like on your, on your phone or something that's like reading an, an, a news article on the web. And there are also many links to videos and other neat interactive aspects in the on, online annual report. And we're hoping to have our 2021 ready for today. We're almost there, um, but hopefully by the end of the week or early next week, so you can check out our, our 2020 annual report soon. And thank you again, everyone, for coming and, uh, and participating. This was a lot of fun. And uh, I would just like to reiterate that BTI is an independent nonprofit research institute, and we operate in part thanks to the generosity of community members like you. And if you would like to make a gift to support BTI, you can donate online at btiscience.org slash give, or, or email our development team at development at btiscience.org. Thank you all for your interest and support of BTI and have a wonderful day and be well. Thanks everybody. Thank you.